Okay. Uh, so thank you very much to the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, the organizers uh, are some of my best teachers, and I assume that they've given me this, uh, this uh, opportunity so that they can check out you know, how well I've done as their student. Okay. So, Adip, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about this topic uh, called as fractons. And uh, this work is done in collaboration with uh, Roderick Mosner uh, from Dresden and uh, a very smart young postdoc, uh, Andres Leaf and uh, Piotr Su Suvorka. Okay, so uh, how will I be spending your next half hour? It's listed here. I don't know how you will spend your next half hour, probably looking at email or something. Right, and uh, so the, I'll just give you a brief review of fractons. Uh, I haven't heard any talk on fractons here. That's probably because I was not here. And, uh, but, but I think it's true that there's been no talk on fractons, right? Okay. Uh, and then I'll uh, use this review to pose a very specific question or set of questions. And then I will give you an answer to those questions. And this is what we'll call as the K and Maxwell theory of fractons. And uh, this is something that we just posted recently. And then I'll start try to discuss uh, uh, the physics of these K and theories. And uh, we'll start with a simple set of uh, questions in these one N theories. And this has something to do with crystal melting and so on. So this is old wine in old bottle with the old label, but with a new font. Right? So this is what it's going to be. Right? And then I'll conclude with uh, some uh, br broad uh, outline of what we think could be interesting future directions. OK, so let's just start with something with many, many, most of us are familiar with. So we are familiar with uh, things called topologically ordered phases. And uh, the poster child for that is the toric code. So uh, the model for that is given by an uh, Ising gauge theory, which sits on a, say, let's say, a square lattice. So it has a magnetic term and an electric term. And such a, such a theory, if you put this theory on some sort of manifold, say a torus, it has a degeneracy of four. And the central thing here is that you do not have to have a square lattice. You can actually define this on any kind of lattice, including amorphous lattices and so on. And as long as you put the theory on a manifold with genus G, the degeneracy will be two to the G. Right? So that's the, that's the statement. So it doesn't depend on the structure of the lattice and so on. It just depends on the topology of the manifold. So such a theory has gapped excitations. So these excitations are electric and magnetic charges. And they are mutually semionic and so on. And you can excite a pair of them. And then you can move these charges around freely. Okay. So this, the fact that there's a topological degeneracy that is there for the system is why this is a system that's useful for quantum computing. Because you can use these degenerate states to encode information and and the topology will protect it from decoherence and so on. OK, so that's the idea. But there's a fly in the ointment. And that is that if you go to finer temperatures, then the fact that these monopoles can move around can gain them a lot of entropy. And therefore, these states may not be useful, or such systems may not be useful if you are at finer temperature for, uh, and, and all these ideas of topological protection and all are, uh, are, are again questioned. So these sort of issues actually motivated people to start thinking about models and systems where you would have some kind of topological protection kind of idea, yet you do not have these charges that move around freely and destroy your state and so on. So this was the motivation for some of the things that uh, came up. And uh, those are these things called as these, uh, I think something has gone, yeah. These things called as uh, fracton phases. I'm not going to go historically through this, uh, this uh, developments. Rather, I'm going to take a, a, an approach where I'm going to use a single model to try and illustrate all the essential ideas. Okay? So the main idea is that uh, you, you can try to define theories, say, on a cubic lattice, where you know, each link of the cubic lattice has a, a, an Ising spin. And you define a magnetic term as a product of 12 spins. So this is a cube of the uh, elementary cube of the cubic lattice in three dimensions. And what I'm doing is I'm taking all these 12 spins that are there, and I'm defining a magnetic term in this fashion. Okay? 
And then there is an electric term you can define, which is also the, you know, the gauge uh, transformation sort of thing, is that what you can do is you, you can take this plus here. You see there's a plus here. So there are four of these spins. That's what this four. And this plus has a normal to it. So in the way I've drawn this here, this plus has a normal in the x direction. So that is what I call as plus alpha. So if alpha is x, then that would be that particular plus. And if alpha is y, for example, that would be that one. So that would be the plus, and so on. And you can define a Hamiltonian in this fashion. And this problem, of course, turns out to be interestingly exactly solvable and so on, because it's integrable and so on. And the interesting thing about this is that this model on this cubic lattice with periodic boundary conditions has a sub-extensive degeneracy. So what do I mean by sub-extensive? You see, if I, take a, if I take a box whose size is nx in x direction, ny in y direction, and nz in z direction, the degeneracy, the ground state or any other excited state and so on, the degeneracy turns out to be 2 to the power some number which depends on not the system size, but some, some lower power of the system size. So this is what we mean by sub-extensive degeneracy. Okay. okay. Now, the most interesting difference with the toric code is not just the degeneracy, but the fact that the degeneracy depends on which lattice you use to define this, this theory on. So I've defined this on the cubic lattice. The exact same theory can be put on other lattices which have, you know, six bonds coming out of a site. You can construct lattices with six bonds coming out of a site. You can define exactly the same kind of theory. And there, the degeneracy will be different. Right? And how it will be different is that there will be a different factor on this nx plus ny plus nz. It will still be sub-extensive and so on. So the, the UV information about this lattice seems to have, uh, you know, have uh, a significant effect on this. So these gentlemen here call this thing as geometric order instead of topological order. Okay? So this is the sort of uh, things that happen. So why would you call them fractons? So for, to understand why you call them fractons, you have to look at what are the excitations of the system. So again, just like in the toric code, you have gapped excitations. And these gapped excitations can be of the magnetic variety or the electrical variety. I will use the magnetic variety to, uh, to give uh, ideas of what we want to do. So what happens here is that, let me show you a demonstration here. So let me just start with the standard toric code here. So I start with this, and I, I go to a site. So this red dot there would mean that there's an upspin there. I flip the upspin, it goes down. So I create two monopoles, right? So those two monopoles have been created. Now by single spin flip, by local spin flips, I can move those monopoles around. So you can see that I can just, you know, I can keep flipping spins, because all of us can do this all day, right? And you can just move them around. OK? All right. So that's the, that's the uh, familiar toric code. Now let me go to the x cube model. Okay, let me just start again. OK, and what I do is, so this is the ground state. All spins are up. Right? And I go to some point, and I flip a spin. So I go to this and flip a spin. So when I flip this spin, you see that I create four monopoles, if you like, four magnetic charges. Those are those four shaded cube in light green. Now what I try to do is, I try to move them by single spin flips. Let me just try to move it by a single spin flip. So I flip this spin again. So you see, it's not, it, it, you see I have now more monopoles there. That means I have, I have, I'm not in the same degenerate manifold of, you know, the four monopoles. I've gone to some higher, higher energy manifold. So it's not able to move, right? Okay. But what can I do? So I unflip that spin. Now what I try to do is I flip this one. So now you see, I am able to move two of these objects freely. And you can see that I can move two of these objects freely in any direction, actually. So you see, I can move this freely, right? And so on. So I can move this this way, right? But you see, I can't move it in an arbitrary direction. So single charges cannot move. Dipoles can move. 
but in specific direction. So the claim is that such, such excitations have fractional mobility, that they don't have, they don't have the full mobility of what we would have seen in, for example, the toric core. And this is why they, call, they are called fractons. Right, because they have, these excitations have fractional mobility or constrained mobility. Okay? And now you can see that, you know, if you can, if you can encode information in such system, then, you know, you know even, even, if you, even if some of these are excited by finite temperature, you know, they can't just move around, proliferate, and so on. So it will have some sort of protection because of this kind of constraints. Interesting question. So this, the dipole, the one that I have drawn here, can move only in the xy plane. That's the fractional mobility. So the way it's stated is that it has one-dimensional mobility. The charge and spin would mean, uh, so the charge in this theory is this A operator. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, charge is something that's related to the gauge, the gauge, you know, what couples to the, you know, the, the gauge freedom, right? So, you know, charge is what, so for example, this A is what I would call an electric, you know, the, the charge of the theory, right? Maybe, maybe, is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay, so this is just the, the you know, in the, in the toric code, for example, you know, the, if, if, if I had a monopole excitation, right, where, you know, on, on a single placket, there is a, there is a magnetic flux of opposite sign. That's what you would, uh, you know, and there's an electric version on the, on the, on the pluses, right? So these are analogous to that. Okay, so this is uh, fracton. Yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're anticipating the things that I'm going to do. Yeah. Okay, so the question what Sri just asked is, can I separate all of these out? The answer is yes. I'll start again. So I start here, and I, I do this, right? So I'm just separating these out, right? And then I, I try to move this guy. But you see, then I, I, create, I get into trouble, you see? So what I have to do is, oh, sorry. So what I have to do is I have to create a membrane of, I have to create a membrane of, uh, of flipped spins. So you see what I'm doing? You'll see that, I don't know whether you can see it on your screen. Do you see what I've done is, I've created a square of blue flipped spins. Okay, it's not entirely clear. But you see what I've done is, I've created a square of blue flipped spins. So you see, typically what happens is, there's a line, if you take the toric code for example, there's a line, the end of which you will have charges, right? And that whole thing will, is what you will, you know, you use to separate. Here, what you will have to do is you'll have to have a membrane, and the corners of the membranes will have these isolated fractions. So now, if I want to move a single fracton, what do I have to do? I have to flip the full set of pins on the on the on the on one side of the membrane. Only then I can move a, a single object. So that's what is, so that's the, that's the, yeah. No, this is, the energy of this is just the number of the green, right. But if I want to, if, so the point is, I have to have a simultaneous, if, if, if I have, if I, if I want to move it in the same degenerate manifold, I have to have a simultaneous flip of spins on one side of the membrane, to, trans to transfer this. Otherwise, I'll have to go to a higher energy manifold. Yes. It's just because the energy is simply the number of green, you know, the green cubes. Okay? All right? Yes. Oh, my goodness. My... <laughs> My, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I, 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 sorry. Okay. Who is the chair? <laughs> You've got all your certificates from IIC? Yes. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay, all right.
Okay, all right. Okay, sorry. Okay, I, I, I need to rush. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Okay, so this is the this is the this is the this is the uh, story, and so the question is, what would be a field theoretic description of this? Okay, so I think I think there are, that's work in progress. There have been several attempts here, uh, and uh, I will not get into this. So I'm going to change uh, gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about other class of gauge theories that we are we would believe that uh, 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 we are much more familiar with, which actually have fractonic character. Right? So that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I'm going to be discussing mostly. OK. So these are uh, what I would call as uh, Maxwell-derived fractonic gate theories. And uh, many of these were anticipated from spin liquids and so on. Again, I, won't, I do not have time to discuss all that. So I will just uh, point out that there was a very interesting piece of work by Pretko, and actually a series of works, which actually uh, laid the foundations for these, uh, these sort of ideas. So the key ideas are the following. Instead of having electric field as a vector, you make electric field a second rank symmetric tensor. Okay? And then the Gauss law is implemented in this way, where two divergences on both the indices of the electric field becomes the charge. So this is the charge. Then the claim is that this charge is fractonic. Why is that? So if, when you look at this, you will see that if I take the integral over the over this over a volume, you will see that this object will become a surface stuff. It means no process inside the bulk changes the charge. Charge is conserved. In addition to that, no process in the bulk can change the dipole moment of the system. Because the dipole moment is also conserved, a charge, an isolated charge, cannot move. Because if an isolated charge moves, it will change the dipole moment. That means if I formulate a theory in which the electric field is in this fashion, naturally I get fractonic charges. Okay. okay. So how do we? How, how can we make this a little bit more uh, uh, interesting to, or a, a slightly different view of this? So you'll see that you'll, this theory will have a continuity equation. So there'll be a charge current, and the important thing here is that the charge current is not some independent object. The charge current will be actually the divergence of the dipole current. Because you can just see that charge motion will always create dipoles. Right? In other, you can turn that around. So if I have a dipole current, the divergence of that will be the charge current. Okay? And that's what it is. And therefore, the continuity equation of such fractonic theories will look like this. So this is the, this is the story. OK. All right. So you can actually make this much more formal and uh, put uh, uh, things into that. So you can actually derive, uh, you can write down a gauge field where there is a scalar potential, as we know, and the vector potential, the vector potential is a second rank symmetric tensor, Aij. The electric field gets defined this way. The magnetic field gets defined this way. Looks funny, yes. And you can write a Lagrangian density in this fashion, and everything uh, you can do these sort of gauge transformations. And you will actually end up getting this sort of uh, this sort of continuity equation, which is which has fractonic character. And the question is, uh, the, uh, and the other thing is that the source-free theory, or if you write the Maxwell's equations and don't have any charges, you will see that this has a photon. Okay, so this is actually uh, a generalization of electromagnetism. Okay, so this uh, this leads to some interesting questions one can ask. So, what is the general framework to describe? Order n fractons. OK, so I have to define what that means. Order n fractons is you not only have mobility constraints on charges, dipoles, and so on. You have mobility constraints on all multiples up to order n. Okay, so that's the first question that you want to pose. All multiples up to order n. The second thing you want to do is you want to ask, can I have non-point-like fractons? Can I have Fractons, which are lines, surfaces, planes, whatnot. I mean, and higher dimension in higher dimensions, higher dimensional objects. Okay, so this is what we will call as k n fractons. K n fracton would mean something that is k minus one dimensional extended object, and n being the order to which their moments are cons their moments are concerned. 
So this is the question we are posing. Okay? So the answer to this question is what we will call as the K and Maxwell theory. And the 1, 1 Maxwell theory is what we know as electromagnetism, usually Jackson electromagnetism. And uh, the theory that we propose here actually brings together many specific examples and a single umbrella, and so I think uh, provides a, uh, a framework to think about fractals, at least in, in these sort of gauge theoretic. OK, so let me uh, give you an outline of this. For this, I have to, go, I have to dump some baggage on you. Right? So uh, I'm going to denote a symmetric tensor, rank and symmetric tensor, by these, these parentheses. That means that those things are symmetric. An anti-symmetric tensor will be denoted by these square brackets. And a composite index, so if I, if I have k indices, I will just call with capital I and a k. That means there are k indices. And I can permute these indices. So for example, to use this permutation notation, if I, if I permute these ik, then that will be just the sign of the permutations time. OK? So I am going to use an anti-symmetrized derivative. This is what you would be, in, if you use differential forms, this is what we'd be called as the D operator. And so what I will do is, if I hit a D operator on a, on a k form, which is an anti-symmetric tensor of rank k, you will get a rank k plus 1 tensor. Right? And divergence of a k form is, again, you actually bring it, bring it down uh, by 1 in this fashion. So I actually trace out one of these. OK, so that's the notation I'll be using. OK, so uh, if, you are, if you are from condensed matter, you may not have, uh, you may not have had occasion to think about charge uh, uh, gauge theories where the charges are extended objects. Uh, but if you're from some other, uh, like uh, high energy or uh, string theory and so on, then this is what you do for a living. So uh, pardon me if I'm, I'm uh, overstepping my welcome here, but in any case. So, uh, so this is a very well-developed area, actually, and uh, it's been uh, reviewed in many very uh, important works. So the idea here is you start uh, this theory by saying that the charge density is a k minus 1 form, right? That's what it is. And that describes extended objects. And the current will be a k form. And the gauge fields pick up the same structure as these. And you write out exactly the same kind of Maxwell uh, action with this sort of an definition for electric field and this sort of definition for magnetic field. And you can show that you will recover exactly similar looking things as what you would get from electromagnetism. And so you, what you will see is that the divergence of the k form density is actually, sorry, the time derivative of the k form charge density, uh, k minus 1 form charge density is the divergence of the, uh, the current density. And this also, this theory also supports gapless photon modes. So the question now is, how do I construct a theory where I have these sort of objects, but with order in fractonic conditions? All right. So let's just try to first motivate this by thinking about what can we do if I have point-like charges in which I want to end out order in fractonic conditions. So the thing is very easy to guess you make the electric field a symmetric tensor of rank n, and then implement Gauss law in this way. When you do that, you will see that all moments up to the n multiple moment will get conserved. And that means that all of those things have mobility constraints. Because if you know, I cannot move a dipole without changing the quadruple moment, and so on. Right? So you will see that you will, you will enforce conditions like so this is what we need to construct the most general gauge theory that we are looking for. Okay? And for doing that, I have to introduce a, one more mathematical notion. And this is what I will call as KN tensors. And these KN tensors are the workhouses of what I'm going to, uh, uh, the theory I'm going to construct. So KN tensor is a rank and symmetric tensor of, yeah, question. Yes, so, what, so then there is your, what you're asking is you can, you can implement Gauss law in a different way by making this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, so there's, you know, there will be future graduate students. Yeah, OK. All right, so yeah, yeah, OK. Uh, so, OK, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this, uh, this, uh, this K and tensor. So what is this object here? This object here 
is a rank and symmetric tensor of k forms. So if you, if you want to think about this mathematically, you take a vector space, you, const you construct the rank k outer product, you know, this exterior product. And then you treat that as a vector space, and then you take n symmetrized products of those vector spaces. So this object lives in that. Right? So these are the, this is the main mathematical structure we need for construction. OK? So now you'll see that this has very two interesting properties. Adip, please, please, please uh, tell me the, how much time do I have? Oh, four minutes. Okay. Four minutes, including questions, excluding questions. Excluding, question, excluding questions, OK. All right, so, uh, so what happens is if I permute these things, I will pick up a minus one to the k because that's an anti-symmetric index. On the other hand, if I move these, these square brackets around right, without changing the order inside, you will see that it will remain symmetric. So this is the structure, OK? And now, of course, I can hit a D on L, which means it will take, this D will act on these anti-symmetric indices. Similarly, divergence L will act on this anti-symmetric. Okay, so that's the math we need, OK? All right, so this is the main slide. So what is the theory? The theory is written down like this. You have gauge fields where the scalar potential, what we know, is a k minus 1 n tensor. So this is a k minus 1 n tensor. And this A, the vector potential, is this k n tensor. OK? All right. And then these, so the fractonic charges will again pick up the same kind of structure. So this, will, this, is, this is the mathematical structure you will need to endow on the, on, to make this a kn fracton. And that will be the current density. And you can define electromagnetic fields or EM fields. The E is defined this way. You will have n derivatives on this and, uh, uh, and a time derivative on that. And B is again derived uh, using n derivatives on this and uh, on, on the A. And now you can write a Maxwell action quite similar to what we have done. And then you will see that this theory is invariant under this gauge transformation. OK? So when, if you want to make this theory invariant under this gauge transformation, you will be forced to come up with a continuity equation. And that continuity equation is this. You will see that the time derivative of this k minus 1 n tensor of fracton charge density will be n divergences of this. And so you can see that this immediately brings in the structure of all the fractonic conditions that you have. In fact, you can show that this object is time invariant in the volume using this. Okay? So now, you will, if you look at this, you can write down Maxwell's equations. All analogous things can be done. It's done in our paper. I'm not showing it here. You will see that the, this implies that the modes of this theory disperse differently from the standard electromagnetism. In fact, you will see that the dynamical exponent is not 1, it is n. That looks a little suspicious. So it turns out that you can define a whole class of theories, which we call as kn is a subscript z theories, right? Each with whatever dynamical exponent you want. And the trick there is to define the magnetic fields suitably with appropriate number of derivatives. And for that, you need a slightly more slightly more baggage, you need something called k and z tensors, which is done in the paper, and so I will not get into that. So why would you be interested in this? I, you, you will see that in the next couple of slides. So it turns out that constructing these theories with different z's actually is quite useful because you can actually find connections to many physical uh, situations. Uh, I think so, I haven't checked that. OK, all right? OK, so wh what are the physical realizations of this? So quite early on in the game, this what we call in our language 1, 2, z is equal to 1 theory in d equal to 2 was shown to be dual to an elastic solid. Okay? So, so duality will mean that the charges of this elastic, charges of this gauge theory will get mapped on to certain charges, dipoles, etc. will get mapped on to certain topological defects of this, this elasticity theory. So it turns out that the fractonic charges are disclination, point-like disclination. And the dislocations of the elastic solid are actually dipoles of disclinations. And this is a very beautiful paper by David in 1971, which actually shows this, right? And there are a lot of nice pictures in this paper. You can actually visualize this. So you see that this is a disclination. 
And you can see that this dislocation is a dipole of two disclinations. They see this is five coordinated, so there are two five coordinated things here. So it's actually a dipole of this. Right? So why is this interesting? Because there's a there's a theory which says that uh, the there is a theory in d equal to two, the Berezinsky, Kosselis, Taulas, Halperin, Nelson, Young theory, which says which shows that there's a crystal to extract it to a liquid transition in these. First, by the proliferation of dislocations, that is this crystal to hexatic, and then hexatic to liquid by, uh, by proliferation of disclinations. Okay? And if I construct the z is equal to 2, it turns out that uh, we haven't worked this out fully, but we've started on this and it, we think it's, it'll, it'll all hold good, is that the theory is dual to elastic plates. So if you know the, the waves on an elastic plate disperses q square. And the fractons are dimples on the, on the plate, right? Okay, I, I don't have time to get into all this, and uh, okay, it's also not completely done, so let me not discuss that. End of presentation. No, it can't be. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to pose is, I'm going to, I'm going to pose a somewhat less uh, ambitious and maybe a, a slightly simpler question. So suppose I look at the Coulomb sector of one n theories, that means I have point-like objects, but up to order and fractons, right? What would, be the, what would be the Coulomb gas phase of such objects? So the theory can be written down very simply, and you, the charge density is a set of charges, elementary dipoles, and all the way to some kind of P2 poles, right? And what we know for n equal to 1 is that in two spatial dimensions, there is an unscreened phase and a screened phase separated by the BKT transition. And in D greater than or equal to 3, everything is screened. Right? Okay. So if you make, you can give some naive arguments based on energy and entropy, right? You will see that if I take a 2 p pole uh, object in order n theory, you will see that it's, if I have an isolated object like this, it will cost an energy which which can be large depending on system size. And this alpha, the exponent, you can show is actually this. And when alpha equal to zero, you should interpret this as a log, right? That means that there must be a sufficiently high multipole for which there'll be a log dependence of systems on energy on system size, which means that there is a possibility of an unbinding transition of such objects, or a possibility of unbinding of P plus one multipole objects to make, you know, plasma of these guys. Right? So that's what is the possibility. So you can actually do a detailed RG analysis of this. So the RG analysis will actually map this onto some kind of sine god model with, uh, with cosines. No, it's an arbitrary D. It's in DD. Right? Okay. You can map this onto that, and then you will see that there are many different cosine terms depending on all the elementary charges that you, on, a, on the elementary excitations that you keep, like di charges, dipoles, and higher multiples, and, and so on. So let me just tell you the punchline. So if you look at this, if you look at this in n equal to 2, d equal to 2, and keep both the disclinations and dislocations in the theory, and do an analysis carefully, you'll come up with a somewhat interesting conclusion. So what I'm doing is I'm doing, I'm at very low temperatures. And what I'm plotting here is L is the, is the uh, e to the L of, uh, of the renormalization group, log of the, uh, the size scale at which you're looking at. You see that the charge fugacity, namely the fugacity of disclinations, it dies, right? But you see that the disc, at low temperatures is supposed to be a crystal, which means that the fugacity of the dislocation is supposed to die. But what happens is it has some dangerously irrelevant character. Right? So it dies, and then over some size scale, it starts to grow up. Right? And then you see, what I'm plotting here is the inverse shear modulus. So you see, there is a size scale over which the shear modulus appears constant. It doesn't change as a function of system size. So this is the crystalline phase that you are seeing. Right? The shear modulus is independent of size scale. Right? That's what you're seeing. However, if you go large enough system size, you see that the inverse shear modulus diverges. It means the shear modulus is going to zero, which means there's no crystal. The bulk modulus doesn't change. 
So what is the conclusion of this? The conclusion of this is that the crystal, the crystalline phase in two dimension is under question here. If you keep all of it in the theory and do a careful analysis, there's no crystalline phase at, at large distances if you look at the system, large enough system sizes. So if you estimate, so this is a picture from Hubble deep space, right? So if the crystal were that big, so these are distances between galaxies, if I have two elementary dislocations, they will get screened by, I, I'm, I've run out of time, yeah. They will get screened by dipoles of disclinations that will pop out. So now you wonder, now you understand why experimentalists from ISE want more space, because if they want to prove our theory, they have to have all the space they need to actually set up the crystal. Yes, Anandya? Okay, all right. So the reason for this, I actually, there was, that's, that's why I put this thing as question here. So actually this theory is, you know, I had order n derivatives here. Actually, if I want to keep everything, I have to keep all order derivatives and so on. And that is what, is, uh, uh, what gives all this physics. And it's kind of well-known point, actually. Okay, so the big message is that in d equal to 2, there is one DKT transition of the charges, whatever be the order n. In d greater than or equal to uh, 3, there are only crossovers. There are different kinds of crossovers. First, the highest multiples will sort of unbind, then they will screen the next, and so on. And that's the, that's the story. Okay. All right, so that's the summary. And uh, I'll, I'll stop here and, uh, and uh, take any questions by email. <laughs> Quick questions, yes. So, um, yeah, the continuum form, does the continuum formulation recover the ground state sub-extensive ground, ground state? Oh, no, 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 no. The continuum model, can you, can you, can, can you say that? Yes. Okay, I, I, I'm sorry, I did not have time to do all that. The answer is yes, it, there is, and that's that was the meaning of these pictures. So when you take this, when you take the gauge theory and try to do, uh, try to put it on some, you know, try to analyze it, you have to introduce some UV information. That UV information contains all the all the details of what lattice you have, what is the chemistry of defects, right? So for example, if They cannot move. Disclinations cannot move. They cannot move. They're, they're paractonic. So if I take a square lattice, for example, versus, say, if I take a triangular lattice, right? So you see, if I have this Burgess vector for Burgess vector, I'm using the, so that's the same as dipole. If I have this, then if I add, I get something with a higher, higher, so it becomes irrelevant, actually. So you don't need to worry. So the chemistry, if, I, if these two come together, I get something irrelevant. But you see, that will change if I have a triangular lattice. So what happens is, if I have this and this, if I add these two, I'll get this. But you see, they will add to give you something that is exactly the same operator dimension. Right? So I have to keep, I have to, all that information goes into this. So that is how the UV will get built into this. this. Okay, thanks for that question, actually. So what does the Lorentz force look like in these series? How do they, can we see how they constrain the motion? Okay, Shankar, I've not thought about that deeply, but okay, maybe that's an interesting way, with an interesting question. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really thought about this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>